Cavalry Field, but there's a North Cavalry Field, a West Cavalry Field, and a South Cavalry Field. And the South Field, when I say 25 square miles, I'm not kidding you folks, because if you consider all the assets relevant to the battle, uh, and immediately uh, around the battle, that would include Hunterstown, where Jeff Stewart's men are finally coming in. They're finally coming in from Carlisle, and they're hit from the rear by an upstart general from the Federal Forces Main Station. And uh, I'm not going to be part of it here. We're, <laughs> but the reality is that there's going to be a clash. There's going to be a clash up there. Uh, two of his uh, his own brigade, uh, Lee and, and, and uh, 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 not Campbell, uh, Hampton, uh, Wade Hampton, are going to be involved in that. And, and the same casualty. But it's very important to understand what is going to be happening in early in the morning. July 3rd, this day. Custer is going to be ordered back around, way around, this morning to Kilpatrick as his new division commander. And actually, there will be four Union Cavalry Brigades, two under Kilpatrick, two under David and Mercer Gregg, that will be on the Baltimore Pike on the first map here. See these, uh, this is the town of Gettysburg, where the roads come together, make sure they can see it over there too. And uh, you can see the, the four Union Cavalry Brigades that are along the Baltimore Pike. Why they are there is a very interesting question. I don't have time to follow up, but it's curious. Normally, you have cavalry on your flank and covering your rear. If there's going to be a retreat, you definitely want to protect your rear. Would me considering retreating? Well, that's what happens in the discussion at the uh, Leicester House. But then very early in the morning, two brigades of cavalry from the south start coming again from the, from the north. Uh, Lee has met with Jeb Stewart on the afternoon of July 2nd. Stewart is very glad to have him here, although the adjutant to Jeb Stewart says the meeting was painful to long beyond the elite. <laughs> Jeb Stewart was a, almost like a son, a Dolphin son of the family. And there was a lot of anxiety on the part of Robert Lee and Jeff Stewart did not come up alongside Ewell, did not, was not here on the first day's battle, did not have his men here for the second day's battle, a lot of anxiety. He had come down on his own, well, he came alone, but I will tell you, he was not riding by himself in enemy territory for 30 miles. He would have some staff officers with him, but he's leaving his four, actually three brigades, eight brigades he had behind Carlisle, they would be following. As he meets with General Lee, General Lee will have him scope out this side of the battlefield. And he'll go to Brinkerhoff Ridge. And again, not the highest faint elevation in the distance, not round top, but I can just barely see the top of Brinkerhoff Ridge. He gets out there, and what he does is he looks out to the ground and realizes how well it is available for cavalry action. However, uh, he's going to be spooked a little bit because the Yankees are going to have a troll coming up uh, the Hanover Road, and as they're coming up the road, firing up, and in fact, they'll talk about seeing some horsemen uh, up on the ridge who, upon that first fire, like artillery against them, will hurry, uh, hurry off. That's going to be Jeb Stewart. But what he's done, having seen Jeb, having seen his commanding general in the afternoon, having come out here in the evening, and then going back, He's not going to be aware so much of what's happened at Hunterstown. He was not at Hunterstown during the action on what we call North, North Gallery Field. What was his assigned mission, though? He's met with Jeb, Jeb, his commanding general, Robert E. Lee, on the afternoon. He met with him again uh, after he scoped out Brinkhoff Ridge. And uh, apparently there were three parts to his mission. One, according to his adjutant, Henry McClellan, was to gain a position where he could protect the left of Ewell's Corps. Now, where was Ewell's Corps at the time? where well, they were fighting uh, at Culp Hill, some on Wolf Hill. Uh, this is really far out for him to be to protect the, the left flank because you've got two ridge lines between him and Ewell, and you can't just ride cavalry up through the woods and up through the ridge lines. So this is pretty far out. However, secondly, for, for uh, Thomas Monkford, who's a colonel under Stewart, if the opportunity offered to make a diversion which might aid the Confederate infantry to carry the heights held by the Federal Army. In other words, there's some evidence of this, that what he was to do over here was a diversion to draw attention and confusion as a result of the Union forces 
that might aid General Pickett. However, Stuart himself will say in his OR that he hopes to effect a surprise upon the enemy's rear. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about what the enemy's rear is. There's been a recent book out which talks about the enemy's rear as if it's the back slope of the cemetery ridge. The rear of an army is basically the umbilical cord, this, mat, this very important route to the rear, uh, which will be wagon trains, it will be for, for reinforcement, for resupply, uh, it will be for communications, it will be for retreat. Robert E. Lee is very concerned about his rear, which goes back across the mountains, into the valley, down to Virginia, to the Shenandoah. General Meade was going to be very concerned for his rear. His rear is going to have a, a wagon park, actually with hundreds and hundreds of wagons down in Westminster, Maryland, the railhead, and the rear is the Baltimore Pike. Baltimore Pike, look at this map. This is actually where the rear of the Union Army would be. And the yellow is my speculation as to the route that General Stewart hoped to take on the morning of July 2nd, July 3rd, excuse me, to get to the rear of the Union line. So others will uh, affirm this. Now, what's going to happen early morning is going to be like this. Jeb Stewart was probably surprised in the morning when he gets out here and there's nobody out here. There had been, again, uh, David Mercury's great had cavalry out here the night before, but they have moved down to the Baltimore Pike. Next map. And then by mid morning, what happens is Jeff Stewart will be arriving with his first two brigades. Jenkins Brigade, which has been added to him. Actually, a Lieutenant Colonel Witcher is going to be commanding that. Uh, Jenkins himself had been injured. It's another little small story, but he had a head injury. Had, had personally talked to Robert E. Lee, was given instructions from Lee, and then gets hit in the head and uh, doesn't carry out whatever he's supposed to do. But then following would be Chamlitz. Let me introduce some of these characters. Uh, John B. Chamlitz is uh, going to be commanding the second brigade of Confederates to arrive here. Uh, John Chamlitz will be following Jenkins. They're coming from the north, and they're going to be coming from that direction, and they're going to be moving down into a position along this ridge line. We're on a ridge line here, one relatively high ground, a crest ridge is how it's often referred to. Well, again, according to Stewart, he says, we to observe the enemy's rear, watching that line of battle, a line of uh, transportation communication back there. Attack it in case the Confederate assault on the federal lines were successful. <laughs> and I pause to point out, this would be what in modern military tactics would be called a blocking unit. Robert E. Lee has defeated the Union Army repeatedly, but they've always slipped out. Now, if he can get Jeff Stewart to the Baltimore Pike, he can get them down there, then if the Union Army tries to retreat from Gettysburg, they're going to find themselves blocked. Lee wants to ruin or destroy the Union Army, and so this would be an opportunity to do so. Henry B. McClellan, again, an aide, said uh, to attack the rear of the Union of the Federal right flank. Also, W.W. W. Blackford, who's also an officer with Jeff Stewart, says, we're to threaten the enemy's rear. Again, the rear is not the Tinytown Road, the back side of the Cemetery Ridge. The rear is the Baltimore Pike as it extends farther. In fact, uh, Fitzhugh Lee, and I'll introduce him, Fitzhugh Lee is a nephew of Robert E. Lee. Fitzhugh Lee is going to be talking about what happens here. Cam was actually was commanding the brigade that Robert E. Lee's own son, Rooney, had commanded, but he was captured earlier in the campaign. Uh, Fitzhugh Lee says, we were to effect a surprise upon the enemy's rear, using the same wording that Jeff Stewart will do, a surprise. We could get back there without the enemy knowing about it. And then another commander, uh, actually uh, Herman Shirk, who was a uh, leader in one of the regiments of uh, Jeff's men, that we attempted to flank the enemy's army and to cut off its way of retreat. That's a little more explicit here. The way of retreat would be the Baltimore Pike. And then an early, an early historian called the, the Comte de Paris, he had great contact on both sides. He was actually an heir to the French throne, but of course the revolution had ended his possibilities of that. He writes in one of the early great histories of this battle, we were to strike the road, they were to strike the road to Westminster, that's Baltimore Pike, between the bridge over Rock Creek and that over White Run. That's 
closer to where the outlets are today. So again, by what's happening by four o'clock, Farnsworth has been sent in, in, in the morning. He's being sent uh, to the left side under Kilpatrick. McIntosh Union is being sent over to the Tiny Town Road, which leaves temp temp temporarily two units here. Custer is to follow Farnsworth to the other side, but something will happen that will prompt David Mer Mercury Drake to say to Custer, I need you to stay on our right. We're going to mount up, more or less, mm -hmm. and get our vehicles and go about a third of a mile, and then it really is going to get hot. <laughs> Uh, this is north. North, of course, is behind you. But what I think, where we are right now, is this point of woods right here. Look left and right. And you, you see uh, see right here where we are. We started up here. You can see the wood lots, and you can see most of the ground is very wide open. Very wide open, not what you're, you're seeing today. What I say here is what I believe, and there's several early historians and accounts that say that, the, the Stewart's intended route was on the other side of these woods here. Here's where we are. There's a road. It's the Hoffman Road, and it goes down. You can actually see a barn over there that's on the Hoffman Road, and it goes down to the Hanover Road. If you want to afterwards, you can actually go up back around the woods, and you can follow the Hoffman Road that I believe was the path that Stewart was intending to take in order to get to the rear. As he gets up here, he puts out Jenkins' men, dismounts them as a Skirmishers, anytime you have a column on the march, they're vulnerable. You put out skirmishers alongside. In fact, we can see the Rumble Barn. That barn is historic there. The house is actually post-war, but the barn was here during the battle and becomes very important as a landmark, as we're uh, talking about here. Stewart himself, according to the Comte de Paris, woke up at 3 in the morning to get back over here. We also know that uh, Jenkins' men started very early in the morning, very early in the morning. and. Uh, uh, one of Jenkins' men says it was 4 o'clock in the morning that we were mounting horses through fields and on by roads to get over here. So very early in the morning, 4.45 would have been sunrise, 4 o'clock would have been the earliest light. Certainly by earliest light, they are moving over here. And Jenkins' men will come in first. Jenkins' men will again provide along here by the farm a protection for that road behind us, the Hoffman Road, as they're uh, anticipating the other brigades coming up and for the action to be occurring. Several hours, however, were consumed by the other two brigades, that of uh, Lee and uh, that of uh, Hampton, because they had been involved in the action, remember, north at, at Hunterstown. And in fact, Custer, who had also been involved there, he doesn't get to his position on the Baltimore Pike till 4 o'clock in the morning, because they talk about when they're pulling into position down there, they can hear the first shots being fired at Culp's Hill or the artillery fire that's beginning over there. So they're having a very, very, uh, very short night as they're arriving uh, at, at dawn, basically, uh, for any rest that they might get. Uh, we're at this point of woods, again, uh, the point of woods right here. And something important happens here, which is often debated and I think often misunderstood. First of all, Stewart describes Crest Ridge we're on as a commanding ridge, completely controlled a wide plain of, plain of cultivated fields. Now, again, because of intervening trees, we're not seeing the very wide field, but very wide open as he's looking down this way toward the Hanover Road and beyond to the uh, Baltimore Pike. Stewart said it commanded a view of the routes leading to the enemy's rear and had the enemy's main body been dislodged, and that's the word that Lee used, what he intended his infantry, artillery infantry to do on July 3rd with Pickett. Had they been dislodged, as was confidently hoped and expected, I was precisely in the right position to discover it and to improve upon the opportunity. In other words, Union forces routed from the Cemetery Hill, fleeing to safety. If he can cross these op wide open fields, and if doing so, if he can uh, block the Union forces, that, that's a formula to destroy an army. It's interesting, Stuart moved to the scene, and when he came here, the place was, according to one observer, as peaceful as if there was no war that ever existed. The extension of the ridge on his right hid from view the lines of contending armies, that would be Frankerhoff Ridge beyond it, and not a living creature was visible on the plain below. They couldn't hear or see anything. Interestingly, the, probably the artillery barrage that began at 4 o'clock in the morning has ended over uh, on Culp's Hill, 
we're talking about about 8.30 in the morning when he arrives here, so a little before our time here. Next, next thing. And what you can see is that he has two units in place, Jenkins and Chambliss' brigade. Custer was late moving out. He, remember, he'd only gotten in position to sleep at 4 o'clock. Greg is moving in over here. And Custer is to follow Farnsworth going from the Union right to the Union left. Now, Custer initially had been down here, and he's going to be going up there, as we'll see. What happens? Well, all was quiet, and then Stewart does something very strange. He pulls one gun out, again, out here, out to probably where we are right now. One single gun exposed, and he personally directs the firing of that gun. I've been somewhat perplexed, said his assassin, to account for Stewart's conduct in firing these shots because he's firing them in multiple different directions. One gun it would take maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds to load, and then another shot. Another 30, 45 seconds, another shot. Another 30, 45 seconds, another shot by one cannon in different directions. Uh, what's going on? I suppose that there may have been a prearranged signal by which he was to notify General Lee that he had gained a favorable position. Now, a lot of historians dispute that, but this is a guy who was his agent and was here and suspected that's what it was about. Now, Lee, we know, on at least two other occasions, used signal guns, cannons firing to signal something. So it's a... Incoming. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so it could very well have been. But the other thing that's not well understood is if you had a trained ear bike then, when the shot was fired, it would go through the air. You're not only hearing the sound of the, of the cannon fire, but as the projectile goes through the air, it creates a, a whistle or a burr, depending on what it is, a sound as it's moving through the air. And with a trained ear, something very odd would happen. First of all, say four sequence shots, timed very evenly, and within different directions, there's an effect uh, of acoustics, uh, depending on whether something is coming towards you or away from you, where you can hear it sounding differently. And of course, if it's going to the right or going to the left, I think it's very likely. I can't say for sure, but the adjutant says he thinks it possibly was a signal that Stewart is in place. Others have conjectured that what he's trying to do is to rouse Yankees. That doesn't make sense to me because it was supposed to be a surprise. He's not going to intentionally surprise it. Or if you're shooting for quail, for example, you want to spook them because they'll fly up. If you're shooting at human beings, what do human beings do if they feel like they're fired upon? They hunker down. So that made no sense to me. I think it probably was a signal. I think that, that Lee, in fact, I think Pickett's charge was to go off much earlier than, than it actually did go off. The cannon ate until 1 o'clock. My guess is that the action over there was to start probably by 10 o'clock. Uh, the very t uh, early 8.30, he's in position for it. But anyway, uh, we have uh, other early historians who are confirming this uh, idea that I believe is accurate, but I've taken some flack from some other Civil War guys who that know it couldn't possibly be a signal. Well, he did use signals elsewhere. Was that one of those uh, little six-pounder howitzers? No, it was a 12, it was, well, that's disputed as which kind it was, and one reason I didn't identify, but it was been a 12-pounder probably a 12-pounder or a 10 or, or a rifled gun. Depends on which gun it was that was pulled out, and I don't know, there's there's dispute as to which gun was pulled out. But the position, said McClellan, from which Stewart fired the first was near the end of a wooded hill near the southern end. Well, that's the, we're in the hill, the ridge, the point is right there. This is exactly where, where it would have been sent out. There was no response to that fire. Nobody was in range to fire back, no Union forces. But several things happened. For one thing, Stewart says, the firing of my command, and it was mistaken for the enemy and caused some confusion. This fire coming here that nobody on the Confederate side, for example, General Ewell, worried about are the Yankees coming in behind us? But I think it would have been heard by the Union forces too. I think David McMurtry, McMurtry Gray, commanding the Union Division of Cavalry out here, he was probably on the Baltimore Pike, and here's this in the distance, these four shots, and boy, his mind starts thinking, what in the world is that about? Because he stops General Custer, who's following Farnsworth, and says, I need you over here. 
something's happening. I don't know what it is, but I need you over here. Would you stay? Well, customer was always excited to be wherever the action was. It looked like the action was going to be over here. And so without permission, without permission from, from his commander, uh, Kilpatrick, or the chief of staff or cavalry, that's Pleasanton, he stays over here. And this is where we see Custer having come back over here at a time roughly about 10.30 in the morning, you know, just a little before our time now. And again, these guys over here. And then what will happen is the beginning of the action over here. Both sides are going to be bringing up men, but Hampton and Lee, Fitz Lee, are going to be coming in late, perhaps around noon. They're going to be spotted as they're moving, actually from Cemetery Hill, General Howard and, and, and officers on the Cemetery Hill will see those other two brigades coming into position. And this creates all sorts of alarm, and then next, next map. And this one goes like this. What we see here, again, is Hampton will coming in. We have Chambliss here, we have Jenkins here. Now Custer has sent out skirmishers, and there'll be a fight across these very fields right near the Rumble Barn, where coming up from the south will be uh, Custer's skirmishers, and there are going to be serious clashes here on the morning of July 3rd uh, in the fields, both sides having dismounted. No horsemen riding at this point. And then things are going to get really hot, because Hampton is moving into position. Hampton will actually be in the woods back where we started. And Fitz Lee will be arriving and go into the woods over there, all on high ground. And Jeb Stewart then discovers that his plan, thanks, Matt, is probably going to be thwarted where he would be going because let's go this way now. Here are the here are the four brigades are coming into position here. McIntosh has now come in, and by the way, as Gray comes in, he's going to be blocking the route that I think uh, Stewart was going to intending to take. Uh, Custer at that point, realizing, hey, there is real action going on here. I want to stay. They'll get, he'll get permission to stay, which is interesting because we wonder, well, if he had gone with Farnsworth under Kilpatrick, what would have been different on the other side? Now, yeah, it would have been different for sure. I don't know how. But he stays behind. And so we have about 5,000 horsemen. Now, understand how unusual this is from Lee's perspective. Normally, when you're in a field of battle, you take your cavalry and you move them into three different positions. You have some to your rear, and he will have some to his rear protecting the lines. And of course, Meade has done the same thing. He's protecting his rear. Then you'll have about a third to your right and a third to your left. They're mobile. They can observe any movement of the enemy out there. What Robert E. Lee has done the morning of July 3rd is very unusual. He not only sends Stewart out here, Stewart has about 4,500 men, but he also adds Jenkins' brigade to them. So there are about 5,000 horsemen that are coming out here. How many horsemen, how many cavalrymen does Lee put on the other flank? About 100. 55,000, 55, 5,500 compared to 100. This is very imbalanced. This is not a normal thing that Robert E. Lee's doing. He's doing something very exceptional. Why is he putting so many men out here? He's expecting that he's going to be successful through artillery and then infantry to dislodge the Union forces, that they'll be rushing down here and he hopes then to get his men under Stuart to block. In the meantime, however, David McMurtry Drake has been alerted, probably by the firing of the sequence shots, that something's happening, persuades Custer to stay around, and then we're going to have heavy fighting, but it's going to be essentially on the afternoon of July 3rd. This program is only a setup program, really, because we're supposed to be in real time, and I'm already 15 minutes over. But the reality is, what happens here is very important to our understanding. This is not a sideshow to the battle. Mm -hmm. This is part of Lee's plan, Inf artillery, then infantry, then cavalry, by which he can destroy the Union Army. However, of course, his artillery does not work as intended. His infantry, or Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble, they don't work as intended. And what happens out here, and I won't go into any detail yet, but you have attack after attack crossing these fields as Jeb Stewart is trying to gain ground toward the Baltimore Pike. Famously, George Armstrong Custer sees his day of opportunity. He will twice lead counter attacks in the afternoon into the face of rebel attacks coming across these fields. And again, imagine we're talking about thousands of horsemen back and forth across these fields. Incredible. 
action. In fact, very relatively heavy casualties that Jeff Stewart is going to experience uh, for cavalry action. Usually, as the Yankees, as the infantry would say, who has ever seen a dead cavalryman? <laughs> because they would typically not be engaged in heavy action, but they certainly would be right here. So what we have, again, is a setup, really, for the afternoon because, and I'm not going to tip you off because you've got the cannonade and you've got Pickett's charge ahead. We'll see how that goes. But the third part of it, <laughs> the third part of it is supposed to be happening over here with, with cavalry. And uh, without spilling the beans, it's going to be a difficult day for Jeb Stewart.